everyone, and welcome to Pearls on Gloves Off. I'm your host, Mary O'Carroll, and today you are in for a real treat. My guest today is Scott Westfall, Director of Harvard Law School Executive Education, who also teaches courses on leadership, design thinking, and innovation within the law school's JD curriculum. In his role, he leads the Harvard Law School effort to support and develop lawyers across the arc of their careers, particularly as they advance to new levels of leadership and responsibility. He oversees and teaches global leadership programs for law firm managing partners, emerging law firm leaders, law firm associates, and general counsel. He also collaborates with HLS colleagues and other Harvard faculty to design and teach custom programs for law firms, legal departments, government agencies, and other legal related organizations. Welcome, Scott. It is such a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you, Mary. It's, a, it's wonderful to be together with you virtually here, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. I always enjoy our exchanges. Me too. There are so many things to talk about, and perhaps we can start with you kind of going briefly through your journey and your background, even before uh, what I explained you do at Harvard, because I think your path and your experience has actually given you really great perspective um, and skills on how to coach the next generation of leaders. Then after that, we can kind of dive into your role at Harvard and what it means to have an executive program. But tell me about, you know, where you started and your journey to Goodwin and McKinsey. Yeah, thank you. It's been an interesting journey. I started out graduating from Harvard Law School a long time ago in 1988. I moved down to Washington, D.C. because I thought it'd be an interesting place to practice law. There's a little bit of everything in Washington. And I joined a small office of a large firm, practiced there for 10 years, doing a wide variety of great things. And during that time, I sort of found my passion for trying to look at people's development and help people who were in a system that, you know, the large law firm system that wasn't necessarily good at thinking about intentionally about professional development anyways. And so I was running the summer associate program and I was hiring attorney for my six, uh, a hiring attorney for my office for six years. And I was, uh, you know, an informal mentor to so many associates and a writing coach and softball team manager, United Way campaign leader, all of the things <laughs> trying to build community in the office. And through a connection, all of a sudden, um, I was introduced to McKinsey and they were looking for someone to come into their Washington, D.C. office to lead professional development. Uh, they had reached out to an alum who was a friend of mine. And she said, I'm not interested in that job, but I know a lawyer who'd be so good at it. And, and I really didn't know anything about the consultant world at the time. I knew I was frustrated by the big law model and its inattention to professional development and uh, intentional professional development. And so I went over as a courtesy interviewed and all of a sudden it was like looking at the other side of the moon, everything I'd always wanted a large law firm to be doing in terms of feedback development, leadership programs, aligning assignments deliberately with someone's development needs and interests, creating team environments and working effectively in teams. It was all right there. And I jumped ship and I took the job at McKinsey. I was there for six years leading professional development for them in DC and then moved on when Goodwin Proctor heard about me and they said, you speak lawyer, you've seen this whole other model for developing talent. Could you come here and try to bring some of those approaches over to the legal profession? And you know, I was very excited to, to try that. Regina Pisa, the managing partner and chair of the firm at the time, she was the first woman ever to be managing partner and chair of an AMLA 100 firm, is, is very convincing and you can't really say no to Regina. And she, <laughs> she said, you're gonna come here, you're gonna write a book, I'm gonna get, and let you build a team and we're gonna do all these great things. And it all came true, you know, it, it took a while to get some momentum going, but I was very proud of the achievements we made. And it, during that time, I was, uh, uh, contacted by my favorite professor from my Harvard Law School days, David Wilkins. And he reached out when the school had developed a new team-based course, a uh, mandatory course for first-year students during the January term. It was a problem-solving workshop. And he said, hey, you know, you're a problem solver. You know about teams. Why don't you teach this with me? And so for four years, Goodwin was generous and let me do that every January. And uh, and then in um, April 2013, I got a call from Martha Minow, who was then Harvard Law School Dean, offering me the job to come lead our executive education programs. And so uh, since September 2013, I've been a full-time faculty member, and I have absolutely loved what I do. So amazing. I, I want to hear more about that, but let's go back just briefly, because I think 
What is so interesting about your background, having done professional development at McKinsey, and as you said, when you got there, having worked in the legal world for a while, your eyes were opened into kind of what was possible. And then going back to a law firm, you know, the consultancies and law firms, they're both professional services, but they are run very differently. They have different cultures. What surprised you or what did you observe as different in the way that those firms operate or, you know, how lawyers operate versus consultants do? Yeah, from the high level down at the high level, you know, McKinsey right off the bat was telling me we have a dual mission to serve clients and develop people. And those are co-equal. And that was a shocking revelation for me because in the law, in law school, we orient students towards clients first, clients first. And in the law firm world, even in the in-house world, it's always the client comes first. And I think we do ourselves a disservice. It, it's noble to put the client first and, and be humble in service as an agent, not the principal. But we forget to take care of ourselves and and other other uh, you know organizations that the consulting firms, the big four, uh, have figured out that if you put your own people first or you make it co-equal in a mission to develop them, you're going to serve your clients more effectively and you're going to create a more sustainable, viable path towards developing leaders and. That's what I was really surprised by. Then it came down to the micro levels, and I'm starting to see how they actually work so differently. Every time a, a project launches in the, in the consulting world, they have an actual project launch meeting where the partner talks about, here's the client, here's why the work matters, here's what we're going to do. People share about their backgrounds, their experiences, what they're hoping to learn from the assignment, their MBTI types, uh, their scheduling conflicts. They, 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 they have a, you know, a real organizational meeting. And then and, and the research about effective teams, no, you know, I know now as an academic, team launches are highly predictive of a team's eventual success. You know, in one study it was 35%, I think, predictive of success. But in 10 years of practicing law, I never had a team launch meeting. I remember also my, 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 my you know, we, we just don't do that as lawyers work. We don't work in teams. We work in what experts would call a hierarchical loose working group where work flows from the top and goes on down to various levels and then trickles back up and is aggregated. But it, it, you know, in teams and all other professions, the, the military, consulting firms, accounting firms, they will launch with a formal kind of launch. Let's let's get on the same page. What are our goals? Get people excited about the project. They will have reflection throughout the project about what's going well, what's not, not only with respect to the client service, but how they're working together. And right. at, the, at the end, they will always do a post-project debrief. You know, the military is famous for this, the after action debrief. You know, you go around with lieutenant talks to the platoon, like every soldier saying something that went well, something they should try to look at next time to do better. So they're more safe on the battlefield or more effective. And, and again, in 10 years of practicing law, I never once experienced any of that. My, my first day at McKinsey too, the, the, the feedback culture is so different, you know, because I was now in charge of professional development, my assistant brought in a whole stack of performance reviews that were post-project performance reviews, not annual reviews. You finish a project there, you get a detailed written report. I start reading the first one and I cannot believe the level of thoughtful detail in this feedback report. And, and I look at the name, who wrote this? I have to meet that person. They're incredible. And then I put it aside. I start reading the next one. <laughs> equally incredible. Equally, the whole stack, like in 10 years, again, of practicing law, I never once saw a feedback report that was, you know, here's what you could have done better. Here's what you're doing well. Here's what I recommend and how you apply your strengths going forward. They were, they were amazing. And, um, you know, the, the idea that you know uh, performance can be enhanced by feedback is just lost in the legal profession starting from first year so this january i'm teaching a class for first year law students they just survived first year fall and you know they got no feedback during first year fall about how well they were doing throughout the course to course correct, to see, you know, where am I, my understanding of material? How could I understand this better? How could I apply it better? They take one exam at the end of the semester. They still haven't gotten their grades yet. So they're all kind of terrified right now. And it's terrible to me. We're a learning organization as a university and as a law school, but we're not giving feedback for development and growth. We give them grades to rate and rank them for the benefit of judges and employers who might want to hire them. Mm -hmm. And it's causing undue mental health stress, but it's also, it, it's, 
it's it's not helping them learn. And then it's not a surprise to me that we go out in the legal profession and legal organizations are terrible about giving feedback, either in the moment during a project, at the end of the project, or the you know the annual review where you get something that's you know completely unusable for the most part. What what most associates still tell me, and it, and it becomes really difficult. I think you know going to the consulting world and seeing this deliberate attention to to the development and growth of people. They take people offline, you know, every uh, year and a half, two years you're, they, for a major training program to prepare them for the next leadership role they're going to play. And, you know, you mentioned in my biography that this focus of Harvard Law School executive education is to help lawyers across the arc of their careers to develop the leadership and professional skills they need to, to, to thrive. We just haven't had that in our as as a tradition in our profession at all I, you know and you get leaders of you know billion dollar revenue law firms who've never once had a, a you know leadership training and 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 they're they're smart and they can figure a lot of things out and they're you know obviously they're, they're the firms are successful but but the potential is there for so much more and, and to me that makes me sad it's sort of a sink or swim philosophy and when you think about the this is what sink or swim came from the, you know, the, the classic, you know, I'm going to row people out in the boat and I'm going to throw them in the lake and some are going to drown and some are going to swim and we'll yep. figure that out. It's Darwinian. You know, the reality is if you do that, you know, some people are going to need to be rescued. Some people are dog paddling. Some people become pretty good swimmers naturally, but nobody becomes Michael Phelps without coaching. I, you, you watch what Michael coach Michael Phelps did when he prepared for his, you know, great Olympic runs. Um, you watch tape of him. He got so much coaching and feedback. And every time his hand entered the water on his freestyle crawl, it was within a millimeter of where it was the last time. And he was absolutely perfect. All the filming, all the coaching. That's how you produce great leaders. And in our in the legal profession is just not invested that way relative to other professions. We we completely underinvest. Yeah. It, it, this And this is exactly why I love speaking with you, Scott, because I, I feel like you've seen it from both sides. and. You know, I have this saying, just because it's obvious doesn't make it easy. We can look at all these other professions that are adjacent to us or have gone ahead you know, of us in legal. And we look at legal and, and we can identify all the challenges and all the things that we can do better. And yet it feels like it's still an upward battle. And, you know, have you seen law firms change, law schools change? It's still it's still the same conversations. I think we are getting better it's more education. There's more of these conversations happening. But why haven't we learned? Why haven't we changed in all this time? Yeah, it's painstakingly slow, is without a doubt. And and in part, it's because again, legal education sets sets us up for this individualistic experience, yes. not a team based experience. And what I know from teaching about lawyer psychology is that we get wrapped up in a task orientation. We tend to move from task to task and keep our heads down. We're the least self-reflective of professionals is something I like to say. Mm -hmm. uh, other professionals are taking the time to step back and say, where am I in my career? What could I learn to be more to be more effective in this next role I'm taking on? We don't take that time for reflection because we're always busy in service of the next client and service of the next project. We move project to project, heads down, and it 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 makes it very difficult. We're also, of course, a very tradition bound tradition bound uh, profession, which makes things trickier. We're yes. we're more diverse than the average population, so uh, advocating for change within that system is hard. And, and I'm not one who believes you throw out the baby with the bathwater. There's a lot of things about traditional legal practice and education that are very helpful. I mean, the, right. the legal analytical skills and the powerful analytical tools we develop in people are, and, and the oral and written advocacy tools we develop as lawyers are fantastic. And the systems to develop those are important to, to retain. We just need to, to, to build on them and flex with them. Uh, to produce better lawyers and also to pr produce a more sustainable profession and one that is anchored in meaning and purpose. Those are the things I'm talking about most these days coming out of the pandemic, um, you know, in two, with two lenses. One is that during the pandemic, of course, the, all the research you're seeing is about people were searching for meaning and purpose in their work and the great resignation was happening. Large law firms were 
experiencing 30 to 35% associate attrition. So during that time, so many of my former students, third, fourth, fifth year associates at law firms were calling me, asking me to help you know, place them somewhere else. Um, and, and, and the undercurrent of, the, of that, a lot of it was just, you know, like I can do this, uh, but it's, you know, either not challenging or I really don't know what the purpose and meaning of yes. it is. And they were looking for something different. Yeah. Um, we are we are terrible at four levels on this. And this is, you know, it's striking. Um, at the profession-wide level, the legal profession itself has a you know pretty poor reputation across the world in terms of how helpful it is to people. We don't do a good job as a profession talking about how lawyers make a difference in the world. I was just told that the new head of the IBA is going to engage a consulting firm to, to show us with metrics like how important lawyers actually are to the, you know, the rule of law, the functioning of societies. And, and we don't tell that story well. At the organizational level, you know, I did a survey just at the beginning of COVID. Only 14 of the AMLA 100 firms even had a mission statement on their website. Um, it's gotten marginally a little better, but most of those mission statements were written by the marketing department. No lawyer knows them. Mm-hmm. And in organizations, as have I, where you just knew what the mission was. At McKinsey, every day I log in, the mission and the values of the firm came right up on my computer. We talked about them and lived them all the time. Not perfectly, no organization does, but but there they were. And it was a really helpful guidepost when there were decisions to be made right. and actions to be taken. Harvard Business School has their mission statement everywhere around the school. You can find it. They all know it verbatim. Harvard Law School doesn't have a mission statement. Like our, as lawyers, we don't we don't orient ourselves that way. We're in service of others. Again, it's 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 a really strange thing. So, at the organizational level, people aren't coming to work knowing that they're making a difference or why they're there. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's 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 sad. Then at the project level, as I mentioned, the team level, you're launching the project, you're assigned to the project, but no one tells you why the work matters, who the client is, right. what the context is, and right. You're left out of it. And if, and if you may get a, a singular conversation, but the team's not gathering and developing team energy around it. The fourth final level is the individual leadership level. The most powerful leaders, when you look at who gets buy-in among their people, are able to tell what we call from our Kennedy School of Government, the story of self. This is from the leadership practice public narrative that was developed by Marshall Gans at our Kennedy School. And the story of self is, you know, why do I deeply care about something? If I can't articulate that to you, why, why should you care about it? His framework is three stories, the story of self, you know, why do I care? The story of us, why we should all care. And the story of now, what should we do now? It's a bias towards action. It's beautiful. It's a great framework. I'm working with law firm leaders, general counsel, and law students even in my class tomorrow on this. Can you tell your story yourself? Why did you come to law school? Why are you a lawyer? And it's we did a full day workshop in a, in a program we ran for senior law firm leaders. Um, it was a, a five and a half day program. One of the days was devoted to this public narrative practice. And it was fascinating because we, we had these uh, you know law firm leaders, very senior people digging deep into their motivation and, and being able to craft and tell a narrative. And it only takes a minute or two, but it's incredibly powerful when you suddenly hear from someone why they deeply care. And again, 10 years of practicing law, I never once heard a story that sounded like, you know, here's why I became a lawyer, here's what I really believe in. That's so motivating. This is all, you know, uh, right in front of us. But I think, as you said, we we miss the obvious sometimes that, you know, the second framework, meaning and purpose is one. Oh, maybe one one other anecdote that I thought was really funny. So um, just before the pandemic, one of my former students sends me an email and he he had gone to a legal tech startup after law school, then went to McKinsey for four years. And he was just leaving McKinsey and he wrote a blog post about his wonderful experience in consulting. So he sends me the blog post. Professor, you might want to see this. I had a great time at, at, at McKinsey and want to let you know, read this blog post. So I read the blog post. I call it up and it says, In the third paragraph, opening sentence, unlike people from older generations, I and my friends really want to find meaning and purpose in my work. And it just floored me. I'm like, wait a minute. He has the impression that I don't care about meaning and purpose (laughs) and none of us in older generations do. Why? Because we don't talk about it. And we're, you know, we've never really explained to them. Of course, we care about it. You cannot be, you know, a, a, a successful, you know, legal professional without having some tie to caring about what you do. It's just too hard. Right. And 
There's so many law firm partners I know who are amazing lawyers and deeply they love it, but they've never said why, <laughs> you know, yeah. they don't know how to talk about it. That 90 minute conversation can be so motivating for people. The, the second level that I miss, the things that are so obvious are that like we, we don't live sustainably as a profession and we have, we continue to, ha- to have, you know, you know, really high levels of mental health issues, you know, suicide, substance abuse, and beyond that, just burnout. Um, and, and we've created systems, and this is both law firms and in-house practice, sometimes government practice as well, and public sector lawyers, where you know we ask so much of the individuals that you know it, it, it's 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 not work done at a human pace. It's it's highly individual and not team based, so it's easier to burn out because you don't have community that way. You're isolated and. You know, it has is deep implications for um, the profession itself. We're not able to retain some really great lawyers who otherwise um, should be part of the system. And I, I'm looking at the conversations that corporate leaders are having around ESG. You know, when I think about environment, social governance, and I think about stakeholder-driven capitalism. It's it's really interesting concept. I think there's a lot of academic debate about how you might put that in place or whether it can ever have teeth. The regulatory agencies are studying it, but now what's happening is corporate leaders are telling their general counsel, you need to start reporting on ESG related matters. And they're going to start reaching out to their outside counsel and say, look, you have to report up. Very mm-hmm. simple what happened in the diversity, equity, inclusion space right. where corporate leaders cared about it. They told the general counsel to care about it. The general counsel pressured law firms to become more diverse. And that dialogue and that reporting is, is you know, quite extensive now. Um, progress is slow, but the dialogue is extensive. I kind of feel like this could move in that direction where if we're thinking about stakeholders and we're thinking about who are the stakeholders in, in the, the legal component of the system, general counsel, legal departments then reaching out to their law firms. What does sustainability mean in that context? And for me, I think in the products world and supply chain, sustainability is, you know, renewable energy, renewable uh, um, sources of supply. We're a human capital profession. And to me, I really hope that we can start a dialogue around sustainability of human capital and and figure out how could we build better models of the practice of law so that um, people can 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 thrive and we're looking at a broader set of stakeholders in the system to me as one example stakeholders in the legal system are families of lawyers Mm -hmm. who be their (laughs) you know the the parents and the family because they're they're working or they're under all that stress all the time you go on vacation and you're constantly on the phone or taking calls and you know, why can't we develop some concept of sustainability and a dialogue between general counsel and their outside counsel, between general counsel and their business partners about the sustainable practice of law, understanding that when a crisis happens, a crisis happens. But I look at the, you know, other professions when, you know, a doctor's on call or off call and they've, they've worked out systems so that not everybody has to be available 24-7. Law firm partners will tell me, look, it's just the client environment. The clients demand it. I don't actually think that's true. I don't think there's there's not even a dialogue there. You were in-house, and I think you probably saw that, right? Right, right, right. So so much stuff that you're talking about is so important and such great education. And I'm I'm so glad you you have the programs that you have at Harvard, because that is how we're going to train the next generation of leaders. I, I know we already talked kind of all around it, but your current role at the law school and, and the exec education program, do you want to talk briefly about what that role is and what that program is and how people can kind of get involved and learn more from folks like you? I'd love to, because, you know, I'm very proud of, you know, what we're, what we're doing and, um, excited that we've been able to build it. Harvard Law School Education was launched um, in 2007 with a program called, you know, uh, Leadership in Law Firms for Senior Law Firm Leaders. It originated from research that Harvard Business School had been doing for about a decade, you know, before that on professional service firm leadership. And 
Professor David Wilkins at, at, at Harvard Law School, uh, recruited Professor Ashish Nanda at Harvard Business School to come over, join the law school, work with Professor John Coates as well, and develop Harvard Law School executive education as you know, a, 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 a model that could start help developing lawyers, again, in their leadership skills across the arc of their careers. And the original content was, you know, highly business school influenced. Some of our content still is, but we've now been developing business school style cases, simulations, you know, uh, research and lectures and, and knowledge specifically translating leadership concepts and frameworks from both our Harvard Business School and our Harvard Kennedy School uh, colleagues, other paradigms as well, for the legal profession itself. And so now we have these very intense business school style leadership programs for law firm leaders, younger to mid-level partners, law firm associates, in-house counsel, mm -hmm. uh, uh, government lawyers as well. And uh, specific master classes that are focused, you know, targeted on a, on a deep dive into particular topics like adaptive leadership and leading through change or innovation and how to create an innovative culture and transform your client relationships through innovation, collaboration and how to make that work, uh, you know, in a challenging environment. We have a, a fantastic, you know, MA related course now too, just to, to, you know, to leverage some of the strengths of our faculty around that expert, that uh, topic. The program is, you know, uh, we, we do virtual work and, and we adapted to do that during the pandemic, but we have a wonderful facility. The law school gave us an entire floor of a building. And so we've got the nicest classroom, I believe, at Harvard Law School. All this amazing technology that Brad Smith, the chief legal officer and uh, president of Microsoft, uh, had donated to us, which is fantastic. So it's a, it's a it's an environment where people come from all over the world. When we run our leadership and law firms program, we'll have 60, 65 senior law firm partners from 20 different countries. And, uh, you know, 60 to 70 percent of our participants are coming from overseas. So it's it's amazing to me that Harvard then becomes a gathering place for the world's legal profession. And we we talk about and compare notes what's happening in the various legal markets. And what's what participants find astonishing is that the partner in Peru has the same problems as the mm -hmm. partner in Germany and right. you know the, the 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 partner in Central America and um and in Chicago and the discussions we have are very lively we, in the edu executive education teaching style it's highly interactive um not the the aggressive socratic method we experience as first year law students and People learn as much from each other as they do from us. We're facilitators of the conversation. Um, we keep building in as the profession is changing around us. We collaborate with Harvard Law School's Center on the Legal Profession that Professor Wilkins leads as they're researching all of the different changes that are happening in the legal profession. We're writing new cases and we're teaching content and we're, we're connecting leadership and other frameworks to those challenges in order to help leaders of legal organizations move through them more effectively. And it's just, it's an incredible, very, very fun environment. We, we run probably 25 programs a year at this point. We do custom programs too for, you know, a, a particular law firm might bring, bring a whole group of partners to us or in-house legal departments come, uh, you know, from around the world and, and gather together too. And uh, it's highly energizing and I love it. It's it's great. I will put a plug in because I've um, had the privilege of being part of uh, several of the programs before. And I will say you do bring together amazing people from diverse backgrounds all over the world after, you know, whatever it is, a few days together. You really feel like you know each other and you've connected, you know, on a personal and a professional level. You walk away having learned so much, but also, you know, and talking to people who've been through the program you feel truly transformed and energized afterwards and kind of ready to take on the next big thing and the next adventure with yeah. all the new tools and skills that you've developed and all the learnings and uh, the people that you've met. So it, it is a really phenomenal program. The, the next sort of direction I wanted to take our conversation, you mentioned um, one of the courses or one of the skills you talk about a lot in your leadership training is adaptive leadership. And you and I have chatted about um, this before. I have always said that I think uh, it is one of the most critical skills to have in a legal leadership or a legal ops role. So would you mind just giving us your description of what, you know, how would you describe what adaptive leadership is? It's, you know, it's, it's a wonderful 
framework and it fits the legal profession in so many ways uh, that I've, I've been really excited to work with our Kennedy School of Government uh, colleagues to, to translate it in particular for the roles that lawyers play within organizations and, and to transform legal organizations themselves. So mm -hmm. the fundamentals of the, the fundamental principles are first, leadership is an activity it's not a role and so you can lead from any level how do you how do you creating change means you can start from anywhere wherever you are in the system so taking stock of that you start to to analyze what's my formal authority what's my title my who i have a formal role yep. what comes along with that and what's my informal authority informal authority being my my network my relationships my goodwill my reputation my sense of humor all of those things that that allow me to have influence, whether or not I have a title or not. And I can then step back and see, here's where I am in the system. How can I increase my informal authority? How can I uh, start partnering with people in formal authority roles who might be helpful and, and are gatekeepers, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, it might be potential allies or champions of the change I want to create. It's a very system systematic look at, you know, who are the players in the system first, you know, and what's the power structure? And then as I start to think about what the challenge is, I, I look at the difference between what's a technical challenge and what's an adaptive challenge. And there's two very different problem solving modes for those. Mm -hmm. A technical challenge is where, look, we've got a problem, but there's known expertise out there. We've seen this before. Other people have seen this before. We know how to fix it. To fix it, I just have to get time, money, resources, people, a project plan. We're going to crank it out. And we're going to fix this because yeah. it's been done before. Correct. When, when when COVID hit and we all had to get on you know, Zoom platforms to serve clients and do our work, that was a technical challenge because the knowledge was out there. The, the software was out there at Harvard. They taught us about teaching online because there was knowledge existing about that. It was a lot more technical than adaptive. And we we, we solved that problem. An adaptive challenge is when, look, things are, are changing and there's no playbook for this. Like this is new stuff. And when you're in that world where there's new stuff or there's difficult things, there's a problem that we've been trying to fix for a very long time. And all the technical fixes we tried aren't working. It's a signal that it's a different kind of problem. And, and just trying to apply a technical fix isn't going to work. Solving an adaptive challenge is first doing a really broad empathy driven stakeholder analysis. Who are all the people in this system? What are they holding on to? Why are they afraid of change? What are they afraid of losing? And you're going out and it's a lot more listening than talking. You're trying yes. to figure out, tell me about like what you're afraid of. Tell me about how this works. Tell me about your deeply held values, ways of working, beliefs. How is it that I can move you forward through change without acknowledging that and helping you feel heard and understood as we're asking you to move through change and to give up some things that you're afraid of giving up? It's a much slower process. It's much more deliberate. It's a lot easier to issue a memo from the top and, you know, try to demand that change is going to happen and things don't happen, yes. uh, you know. Two of, two of the areas where, you know, I'm consulting a lot with law firms, I do a lot of private consulting and keynote speaking and things like that is, you know, one are diversity, equity, inclusion issues and another on the new world of work. And, and what do you do post pandemic in terms of how people work in the office, home, those types of things. So with DEI issues, it's very clear. They're very clearly adaptive. There's, you know, we have been trying technical fixes. Oh, we put in a mentoring program for junior associates and that's right. going to everything and right yeah, right but it didn't fix everything and um the reason is it didn't change any of the behaviors about how work assignments come you didn't interrupt bias you didn't um uh get universal commitment among you know the the people with work and and, and the power players in the firm that this actually does matter um you're not aligning and understanding what those barriers are and what people are afraid of and and how it plays every day. So you've got to do that analysis and that work. I work very closely with the Leadership Council on Legal Diversity in there. We ran a two-day leadership summit at Harvard Law School with 50 managing partners and general counsel back in June on this. And we had them workshopping uh, using an adaptive leadership you know, framework and tools, sticky diversity, equity, inclusion problems that, that their organizations had been uh, working on and pledges that these leaders had made and, and they're now trying to pull 
fulfill as a condition of LCLD membership. So it's a deep dive. With the new world of work, we're actually going to hold a new adaptive leadership masterclass on applying adaptive principles to the new world of work. And, and you can see very quickly, you know, the organizations that issued that everybody's got to come into the office three days a week now. Um, it didn't happen. Why? Because you didn't address the adaptive. You didn't win the hearts and minds. You didn't bring people along. You were trying to put a technical fix on and you didn't listen to people in the system about what they wanted, needed, that that in some practice areas, you know, there's more of a need for people to gather or be together. Others, it's different. People have different home situations. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of complexities you did not take into account. And, and it's not a surprise that you know, all of the policies, the, the issue, I haven't met one firm that says, you know, people are complying with our new work from home or hybrid or whatever policy they're calling it because they can't, you know, they, they didn't do the broader work of adaptive change. What I also love about adaptive leadership is it's not, it, it, it's a model of continuous learning and questioning. So, you, you know, you, you, you pilot a new approach to hybrid work and you announce, you know, this is how we're going to try this. It's a pilot. We hear what everybody's concerned about. We're going to pilot this. We're going to get more feedback and we're going to continue to improve it. Uh, you know, that idea of continuous growth, approval, renewal is hard for us as lawyers because, you know, we, we want to be perfect the first time. We're never going to be, but we want to be. And we're not used to this iteration of feedback and gathering data. It's still astonishing to me. I know you have a background in, in law firm marketing long before you're, you're, you know, you became the master guru of legal operations. Um, I so admire you for that. But in marketing, how many firms are resistant to even gathering client data? I know you remember what a push that was when all of a sudden you were going to start going to partners clients and asking them for data about how well the clients had been served and mm -hmm. we were terrified of that feedback. And again, we, we, you know, we haven't built in that tradition of feedback for our own development and growth, but also in our client service, we're not, we're not doing that reflection very well either. And um, it's just a very different mindset. And the adaptive model is we're continuing to grow and learn. We're continuing to ask questions. The last part of the model that I think is super important is we're having, you know, in, a, in adaptive leadership, there's there's a concept of productive disequilibrium. So you, there's a sticky issue, an elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. And it's really hard. And so how do you, wherever you are in the system, start to raise the heat in the system? You're turning up the, the temperature on the water in the stove so it starts to move around. Can we have these conversations without turning it so high that it all boils out of the pot and explodes? Mm -hmm. But a good organization becomes a learning organization that can tolerate more and more. It's got a strong holding environment for these difficult conversations to, ha to, to happen about trade-offs and what people are afraid of losing and how you're going to make it through this change and how you're going to work together, um, how you serve clients. There's there's precious little capacity of that in a lot of legal organizations and you know, lawyers get really defensive really quickly. They blow up or they most often the response is just passive aggressive. We're going to let those elephants walk around for a very long time. Everybody knows that, you know, there ought to be more than, you know, 20, 21 percent equity partners who are women in large law firms. But there's this big elephant walking around. They're not actually really addressing it or talking about it very well. Um, and it's been I think it took. 10 or 15 years to move from 15 to 16 percent to 20 to 21 percent and the rate of change is now slowing down even uh, yeah you know it's something that how do you in an adaptive situation start to turn the heat up have conversations that need to be have challenge some of the assumptions figure out who the stakeholders are what are they really afraid of giving up why are these barriers there those are conversations we need to have as a profession to be more sustainable, as I mentioned before, and to, and to, you know, solve some of these issues that are just, just out there, but no one really seems to want to fix. Yeah. I, I hope there's a lot of people listening because that 10 minutes was just a master class in <laughs> transformation and how, how to make things happen. And a couple of things that I love that you, you highlighted that um, I think are very true is, you know, one of it is figuring out figuring out how to lead without authority. You may not have the decision maker hat on. You may not be the person who is at the top being able to tell everyone what to do. But how do you figure out how to change the climate, figure out what the issues are, who needs to be involved to make change happen? 
And then second, you know, the culture of innovation or that culture of being able to be open and have the mindset of, you know, could things be better? Can we have these conversations? What are the real elephants that are walking around? That's a a question that I think I get most often from from law firms, like how do we establish a culture of, of innovation? And what do you think are some of the, are you seeing some of that change in um, schools yeah. and departments and law firms, or or what are kind of the the big barriers or drivers of that? Yeah, I, you know, there's there's several, and I think um, it's not easy for us because again, legal training and the and the traditions of the legal profession mitigate against this in so many different ways. Mm-hmm. What what we know from innovative organizations like IDEO is that there's um, they have a great framework on creative difference factors. Like what is it that creates, you know, how do you measure an organization's readiness for innovation and change ability to do that? And when you look at those drivers, you know, the legal environment, both legal departments and law firms are are typically way behind, you know, the first most important one is meaning and purpose. Do people come to work understanding that they're there for an important purpose before like, oops, we strike out totally. (laughs) Um, You know, experimentation. Do we have an experimentation mentality that we're able to quickly try something, prototype it, it doesn't work. And and unfortunately, we have a mindset that we have to be very, we have to be perfect first time and we have to scale it across the entire organization the first time we try it. Yes, yes. There there was a law firm that famously worked with IDEO to redesign their associate feedback systems and um, for feedback in the moment. And I remember the conversations because I was sort of in the middle of of that, those having kind of brokered the introduction between IDEO and this law firm. And the the law firm, of course, wants to roll out the the complete solution to every end to end day at the (laughs) time. And the design thinking approach is no, we're going to pilot this with a small group. We're going to observe, listen, learn. We're going to react. We're going to either go back to we got the problem wrong. We're going to try that again, or we're going to do some more brainstorming, come with a new prototype. And that's how the process works. And it, it took a while and, you know, they were able finally to get there, but that, that rate of experimentation is really hard. Um, yeah. a, another is empowerment. So a driver is, you know, do I come to work feeling like I, my voice can be heard and I can, I'm able to create change from any level. I'm valued that way. And again, we're terrible at that. You yeah. know, we, we kind of think in the legal profession, unless until you become a substantive legal expert in a particular area, we really don't want to hear from you. And to, to me, that's awful because it's often the people in the more junior roles who see all the inefficiencies and can report. I'm sure in legal ops, you know this to be very true. It's like yes, you talk yes. to people who are on the ground in, in the trenches and they will tell you where the problems are, but, but the firms don't want to hear from them. And, you know, unlike the best organizations that are always using pulse surveys and talking to employees about what could be better, how could they work better? You know, how can we serve the clients better? There, there's an astonishing lack of data gathering um, that so people don't feel empowered. It's also true when you work in a hierarchical, loose working group that the ability of somebody to raise an issue when you're junior is really hard. Right. Um, I go up through all these channels. I have to talk to the person, you know, uh, one level above me, not three levels above me and hope that they talk to the next level up. And, and then it trickles back down and there's not a, uh, there's not an efficient process for it. The research on teams about psychological safety is also, you know, very clear that the more psychologically safe people feel within a team, the better the team is going to do. Can I speak up? Am I valued? Is my voice heard? And again, we were way behind other professions that way. And I, and, and we miss a lot of opportunities. I, I hate it. And I, I coach law firm partners. If I hear them say, talk about their associates as kids or something of like that in a pejorative way. I'm like, no, they're actually really highly paid professionals that you yeah. spend recruiting. And like, they have a lot of knowledge about things you don't understand. You're just yeah. not being and leveraging. That's, that's increasingly true, by the way. And this is something I'm stressing with employers right now, uh, law firms in particular, but also in house departments is that we've changed. And I think other major law schools have probably done the same thing. Um, 
most of my students, 80% of my students had at least one gap year between college and law school, 65 to 70% have two or more years of experience. And they're working at, you know, uh, Goldman and Google and uh, Mm -hmm. the, and, you know, NASA or, you know, commanding a Navy ship or all of these experiences are really rich experiences before they come to law school. And when they go into legal organizations right away, they're treated as if they know nothing. No one asks any questions about their background and they don't leverage their skills. I had, you know, I had a a wonderful student um, who's going to graduate this year tell me that, you know, in her summer associate experience last year, you know, she she has a CPA. She worked for a big four for four or five years before law school. She had a you know a second year associate at this big law firm lecturing her on finance and accounting, and you know and, uh, you know it was, it, without any clue that this person you know knew as much as she knew. And uh, systematically, we're not accounting for that knowledge. We're not trying to incorporate into what we're doing. And I think there's a again, people don't feel empowered. Collaboration is another driver. And again, we don't work in teams very well. We haven't learned a lot about how to collaborate effectively and to break down the the trust barriers that inhibit collaboration. Heidi Gardner on our faculty has done a lot of work around that. And is probably the leading scholar of that in professional firms in the world now. It just came out with a second book. Uh, You know, we're, we're trying to make a difference on that one. Another uh, you know, driver that I think is Im- important is, you know, the the idea of, you know, flexible approaches and um, refinement of ideas. You know, you're you're trying to figure out um, how do we gather more data, how do we come up with solutions that you know we we pilot, learn from, refine, move forward, um, building that in to the mindset of a legal organization is very, very hard. The, um, one of the things I teach a lot about for my law students and for practicing lawyers when we do design thinking work and other innovation related work is the idea of how do you brainstorm? And of course, traditional legal pedagogy, you, know, you come into to law school and you're taught that it's your moral duty when someone throws up an idea to gun it down brutally from <laughs> every possible angle. and. And, you know, it's it, that's not an effective way to generate new ideas. And what, what design thinkers will tell you is you to get a good idea, you need a lot of ideas. And so yes. you need to brainstorm broadly. And then it's then it is important. Then our legal knowledge, our skills, our analytical reasoning to, to critically narrow the options and bring them together on a fixed solution works really well. Absolutely. Yeah. But man, it's really tough. And, and with an unstructured process and you just throw a group of lawyers and say, okay, brainstorm ideas about this. It will not go well. That's going to be dominated by one personality. Typically they're going to be, or they're going to fixate on one idea for an hour. They've got, you know, uh, you know, uh, if they have an hour and a half, they'll fix it on one idea for an hour, 25 minutes, take the last five minutes to consider the second idea, maybe, but they don't, they don't generate a lot and then converge. And so uh, I'm very passionate about trying to help lawyers figure out how to how to do that more effectively. What I do know is once once I, I set up the process correctly, they come up with amazingly like creative ideas, and it's super inspiring. The design thinking workshops I run for for different organizations and for my law students, it, it works. I know it does. It does. I am I am so grateful for everything that you do because. Uh, there's so much education that needs to take place in our field. And I often say that the biggest challenge that we have in transforming the industry is education and just opening people's eyes to what's possible and new ways of being able to do things. So all the work that you are doing and uh, the whole team over at Harvard is amazing. So thank you. It is hard. We have a long road ahead of us, but that's wow. what makes it fun, right, Scott? It's, 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 it's a world of opportunity, which I think is exciting. And I think, you know, again, I'm one who um, I, I take a long view of how change can happen. I look at Harvard Law School now versus when I was there. It's a much, much better place. And, you know, it's more humane. Uh, we have our student body is unbelievably diverse and interesting from all over the world in ways that it just never was when I was a student. It, the um, We have 30 clinics. There's a lot more experiential education going on, uh, you know, and, and I've seen I've seen us get better at certain things in the law firm world and in-house departments. Oh, for happy. sure. You know, we're having discussions now that we never used to have the fact that legal operations exists, you know, <laughs> for sure. It is much better than you as a pioneer and you're in your early innovative adoptive 
adopter clients and uh, colleagues, I mean, in, in legal ops, it's you know, super impressive. And, um, and the good news is like, I get to work with our law students and the classes I teach for law students and they are awesome and they're coming. So uh, they, they, they are um, a lot more fearless. They're a lot more set, a lot less set in their ways than earlier generations. If, if legal organizations are able to create environments where they can leverage the diversity of their of their knowledge, their thinking processes, it's going to be fantastic. I just we just have to we we've got to set up the stage for them to thrive more effectively through adaptive leadership, through creating more innovative cultures and in the and the systems that support that. And once we do, we're going to be in a really good place. Well, that's great, and we will get there. I'm confident of it. So. Scott, thank you so much for being here today. I always learn a ton from you and uh, so look forward to chatting with you again. Wonderful, Mary. Thank you so much and uh, best of luck with this awesome project. It's really exciting. Thank you. Thank you.